This church is blessed abundantly with musical talent and ability, and we thank God for that. We do not take that lightly. Well, on behalf of our pastor and our uh, board of elders and our board of deacons, let me say welcome to all of you who are visiting with us. I know we had a number of people that are here for the very first time, which always shocks me when we ask how many people are here for the first time, because we've been here five years. Where in the world have you folks been? <laughs> we've been waiting for you. But how many of you are here? You've been here before, but you're here visiting the revival this week. Lift your hand. Okay, I see a number of you. God bless you. We welcome you. You honor us with your presence, and um, we're so happy that you've come to be with us. Let me tell you what's going to happen the rest of the week. Well, let me tell you what's going to happen tonight, and then I'll tell you about what's going to happen the rest of the week and, and then give you some insight into the month of July. First of all, uh, tonight we'll have a message, and um, if you want to go ahead and turn, you can, um, you can turn to uh, my text. will be in the book of um, uh, Daniel chapter 3, uh, and um, then uh, I'll be preaching, and at the conclusion of that, uh, we'll see how, what the Lord wants to do. But about 8.30, if I'm not finished right then, I want to tell you that there'll be people that will be getting up and leaving, and the reason is they've had about all they can take. Okay, no, uh, we, we have other things that are going on tonight. For instance, there are, are boys and girls ministries going on. There's a youth ministry going on tonight. And there are probably as many people in other parts of the campus as there are in here, if you were to take all of those and combine them together. So there are, there are a lot of people uh, here. And the reason for this Wednesday night service and the way it's structured the way it is is to, uh, to help our Brownsville people. We've been in revival five years, and basically, for most of those five years, the Brownsville Assembly people have been surviving on one service for the church a, a week, and that was on Sunday morning. And so we decided to make the Wednesday night service a service that would be uh, geared and slanted toward our Brownsville people, but would also maybe bless the people who came in for revival. And we, we hope that people will continue to come on Wednesday night because we'd like for them to see our Brownsville people and our Brownsville people to have a little time of um, interaction with uh, some of our visitors. Usually, uh, during the rest of the week, the, um, the um, uh, crowds are so great that we can't we can't do too much uh, personally one-on-one -on -one, uh, except in the prayer time. And so um, that's what's going on tonight. And at 8.30, the, uh, the boys and girls uh, ministries will be letting out, and the parents will be going to get them. And uh, parents, if you have to go get your kids and you want to come back, go get them and bring them back, and that'll be fine. We'll try to end as close as we can to 8.30. But uh, one of the things that we've tried to do in the revival is not put a time limit on God. Okay, if, if you want God, you might as well put your watch aside. If you're, if you're interested in time or you want to get on a schedule and you, you want to be predictable, then you're probably not going to receive what God wants. And so uh, we're just going to go until we get through tonight and we'll see what happens. And um, if you're here and you're on the prayer team, I'd like for you to be ready to respond tonight and help us in case we need you. I don't know exactly where this will go, but we'll see. And then uh, tomorrow morning... At 11 o'clock, those of you that are visiting here, if you want to come to our summer school at Brownsville Revival School of Ministry, it will be held in this room uh, beginning at 11 o'clock. Now, you must register. So you need to get here about a quarter of 11, and in the vestibule, they'll be taking registration. And the good part about that is you can come to our summer sessions, and it doesn't cost you anything. But you do have to register. And uh, that's that uh, teaching. Uh, we're, we're taping some teaching for distance learning. And uh, so you'll have an opportunity to hear uh, some of the finest teaching in the world. I believe tomorrow will be a brother from Australia uh, who will be sharing. And so we invite you to come uh, to that uh, service in the morning, 11 o'clock. And uh, then again, Friday, that uh, same thing. And then Saturday at 11 as well, uh, Dr. Brown will be here. And uh, tomorrow night, Lyndall Cooley will be here to lead the service. Friday night, um, Joseph Garlington. Uh, from uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, will be here, and uh, he'll be he'll be speaking in the service Friday night. Uh, Saturday night, Dr. Brown will be speaking, and Sunday morning, Pastor will be speaking, and so you'll want to be here for all of these services. It's a tremendous week, 
And folks, we don't know what God's doing right now. It, we're in a transition period. As you know, Steve left uh, uh, to go about another type of ministry on Father's Day. And, um, but God's been coming down in this place. I'm telling you, with the, the, the spiritual level has not dissipated uh, or retreated one bit. And we don't know what God's going to do. Um, it's different. It's unique. It's wonderful. And uh, we don't know how long the, the revival will go or, nor what kind of flavor it will be, but um, it'll be one of those good flavors, strawberries, uh, vanilla, chocolate, uh, you know, caramel, whatever your favorite is, it'll, that's butterscotch, it'll be that, okay? It'll be what, you, what we make it, right? It'll be what we make it. So uh, this week's going to be a great week. Now, next week is 4th of July on Tuesday night, and this is for Brownsville people. So our intercessory prayer meeting next Tuesday night will be moved to next Wednesday night. So next Wednesday night at this time, will be intercessory prayer, okay? We'll be praying, uh, for those of you that are visiting, we have a Tuesday night prayer meeting where we pray uh, for the meeting uh, for that week. And um, we have about, uh, uh, you know, 500 to 1,000 people in here on Tuesday night praying. So we'll do that next Wednesday night so that you'll have the 4th of July free. Is that good? That's real good, okay? And see, we're thinking about you. And uh, then... Um, uh, during the, the Wednesday nights next month, um, uh, Richard Crisco will be speaking one Wednesday night. Bob Gladstone will be speaking one Wednesday night, and I'll cover the other one. Uh, there's only, there are only four Wednesday nights in July, and the first one will be a prayer meeting. The other three, the three of us will be preaching. And then in August, Pastor will begin to rotate through the Wednesday night, um, the, the Wednesday night preaching schedule. Okay? So... Um, uh, that's what's on tap, so it's a good good time for you, and we we welcome you here. Um, last Wednesday night, I began a message which I thought that I would complete, but somehow I got long-winded on one point and didn't get through the other three, and so I'm going to pick it up, and this is part two. And the title of that message that I brought last Wednesday night was um, uh, Facts About Furnaces. And I took as my text a portion of Scripture uh, from the book of Daniel chapter 3 and if you want to go there with me right now we'll read uh, that scripture once again and uh, you say well we, we read it last week and I'm aware of that but some folks were not here I want to tell you that believers can be doing the right thing and serving God in the right way and still go through furnaces they can still go through trials okay Case in point is this particular thing that's recorded in Daniel chapter 3. Uh, and um, I'll begin with verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits and its width 6 cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. And King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the uh, administrators, governors, counselors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all officials of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image which the king had set up. So all of those people came. Verse 4, Then a herald cried out, To you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symph symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Everybody say, burning, fiery furnace. These are believers that are going into burning, fiery furnaces. Verse 8, Therefore at that time certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. Then skip down to verse 13. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So they brought these men before the king. And Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying to them, Is it true that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image which I have set up? Now, if you are ready at this time, when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the harp, the lyre, psaltery, and the symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made good, but if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Everybody say, burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. 
It, it is, if that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. Everybody say burning fiery furnace. And he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. Now, my first point with you last Wednesday night is this, that fiery furnaces are a fact of life. Fiery furnaces are a fact of life of life. Now that might shock some of you or it may be overly simplistic for some of you who may be deep Bible scholars, but I just want to make the point that everybody finds themselves in the midst of trials, extreme trials that are similar to burning fiery furnaces from one time or another in their Christian life. You say, well, I'm not in one. Well, hang around for a while. There's one waiting for you just around the corner because there are enough Nebuchadnezzars around that they are going to make demands on you and when you don't meet their demands, they're going to come against you and you're gonna find yourself in one of these fiery trials. Now I want you to go to the book of 1 Peter with me, chapter four, because Peter talks a considerable a bit about these fiery trials. And so I want to give you a New Testament perspective on an Old Testament con uh, truth, okay? And uh, last week I said to you, first of all, that trials or fiery furnaces are a fact of life. In the book of 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12, Peter says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened to you. The, the writer here uses two words. He says, don't, don't be surprised and don't think it strange when you, you fall into these fiery trials. When you find yourself in one of these furnaces, don't get shook up about it and think it's strange or be surprised by it. It is a fact of life. And I said to you, there were three, there were three things that brought us into these fiery furnaces. Um, and, and the first thing is, we ourselves bring ourselves into fiery furnaces sometimes. We will make a decision, and that decision, because it's a poor decision, will bring us to a place of a fiery trial. Have you ever done that? I've done that. And I'm not talking about your marriage, okay? I'm not talking about that. But I am saying to you that there are times when we bring ourselves into some of the most fierce trials we ever have to face. And we do that by decisions. Our decisions create our circumstances. Now, of course, there are circumstances beyond our control. We understand that. But God, if we're sincere in our lives and we, we follow God with all of our heart, God will take care of the circumstances beyond our control. But many of us find ourselves in circumstances that are within our control. And we make bad decisions, and so we find ourselves in a fiery trial. So one of the sources of fiery trials is a result of ourselves. The second source is Satan himself. We live in an alien environment. Do you understand? Satan is the god of this world. We're on his turf. And the only way Satan can hurt God is by hurting God's people. And so we are open sometimes uh, to the attack of the enemy. Now I know that there are teachings in the body of Christ and in Christianity that says if you're a child of God, it's never gonna rain on your parade. Your cornflakes will never get soggy. Uh, everything is gonna be peaches and cream. But I'm gonna tell you that that is not the case. If it were the case, then Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is wasting a considerable amount of time and energy and effort to say to us, do not think it strange and do not be surprised when you fall into fiery trials. They're a part of life. 
And if, if you don't make a mistake that gets you into that, hell will come against you and maneuver things to get you into a place that will put you in a fiery situation. And the third source, and I'm just reviewing right now for uh, those of you who did not hear the first um, point. And those of you that did, uh, this will bring it back to your remembrance. And if it doesn't, go buy the tapes. And I don't get any money out of it, so I'm not uh, trying to sell tapes, okay? Uh, so the, the third source is from people. People uh, sometimes are the source of our fiery trials. And I told you there are two classes of people that can bring trials into our lives. One class of people are those outside of the church, and the, the other class are those within the church. Now listen, I don't have any problem with unsaved people coming against me. I expect that. The Bible says, if you live godly, you will suffer persecution. The Bible also says that the preaching of the gospel is an offense to those that do not believe. And so if you're going to stand on the word of God, or if you're a preacher and you're going to preach the word of God, you might as well understand that somebody's going to be offended. And if somebody isn't offended, there's a good indication that maybe you're not preaching the word. We do not preach in order to offend, but because we preach, people are offended, okay? And uh, if you don't believe that, uh, come to the back room with me after this service, and I'll show you sheep bites all over me after 45 years of ministry. I'm telling you, those within can, can give you trouble, and that's heartbreaking. You know, you expect it from those outside, but you don't expect it from those inside. I remember I pastored a church once uh, in another state, and um, uh, I was trying to lead that church in a certain direction, and those people took the attitude that I had moved to their town and become their pastor to make their lives miserable. When in fact, I had left my family. Uh, you know, I'd moved to another state. No, I hadn't, didn't have a single relative in the place. Didn't even know anybody in that town, or at least didn't think I did, until I moved into town and found out that, uh, that one of my, my chaplain friends, when we were in the Navy together, that he had retired and lived in that town. But I thought I knew nobody in that town when I moved there. And I was trying to get this church to follow a vision that God had dropped into my heart relative to that church. And they would look at me like I was there to, uh, to um, uh, just beat them and to, uh, to make their life absolutely miserable. In fact, everything we accomplished in that church, uh, you could go outside and you could see their fingernail prints in the asphalt in the parking lot where I drugged them kicking and screaming all the way. And uh, you know, and, and that hurts. That hurts when you're, you get into a fiery trial because of those within the church. You, you don't expect that. Those outside, you do expect. And so trials are a fact of life. And the source of those trials are ourselves, Satan, and people without and people within. Now, the second fact about furnaces is this. You can have joy even in the midst of a fiery, burning furnace. You can have joy even in the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. What happens when we find ourselves in the midst of a fierce, fiery trial? What happens? What, is, what does the average Christian look like when they are extremely tried? You meet them at church and they come in and you say, Hey man, how you doing? How do they respond? Man, you wouldn't believe what I'm going through. I'm telling you, hell is just vomiting on me. I mean, you wouldn't believe it. I got up this morning, my wife burned the biscuits. Went out to get in my car to go to work, and I had two flats. Started to work, finally got the flats fixed, started to work, and would you believe it, some kid in a hot rod ran me off the road, and I was down in the ditch, had to get somebody to pull me out, and I was late for, I'm telling you, I'm going through hell. And it's just a litany of misery. But let me show you what Peter says in this same fourth chapter of 1 Peter about going through these fiery trials. He's just said in verse 12, don't think it's strange and don't be surprised concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. Look at verse 13 now. He says, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's suffering. What in the world are you talking about, Peter? Rejoice 
to the extent that we partake in Christ's sufferings? Are you kidding me? That when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Verse 14, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, happy are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. On the part of those who bring the trial, he is being blasphemed. But on your part, he is being glorified. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Four times in these two verses, Peter uses words like rejoice, be glad, exceeding joy, and happy are you because of these fiery trials. It's totally foreign to the way we respond to the situations of life in which we find ourselves. Let me tell you something, friend, tonight. If you are in here and you are going through a furnace, I'm here to tell you that according to the Word of God and according to my own experience, that you can go through that fiery experience and you can have joy, you can be exceedingly glad, you can uh, have excessive joy, and you can be happy in the midst of that thing. Now, notice what I said. I did not say to you that you would be jo joyful or happy because you were experiencing that. I said you could be joyful and happy in the midst of that. Nobody likes to and enjoys uh, some of the trials and some of the things that we go through. If you do, you really relish that, then you're a masochistic person, and I question your mentality. But what I'm saying is that when you're going through those pains and those agonies and those difficulties, Peter says, rejoice, be glad with exceeding joy, and happy are you. Paul talked to the church in Corinth in the second letter, which he wrote to that church in chapter 8. Just flip back over there with me to the left a few pages to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and listen to what Paul says. Uh, in these verses that I want to read to you, with verses 1 through 5 of uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Moreover, brethren, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, listen to this, that in a great trial of affliction, a burning, fiery furnace, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. Paul is saying that this, these churches in Macedonia were going through some great trials of affliction. Yet in the midst of that, they had an abundance of joy even in their, as their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. And what Paul is getting around to, he's going to collect some money from these churches to take back to the saints in Jerusalem who are going through some very severe trials themselves financially. And Paul is appealing to the Corinthian church that they should contribute to this money he's going to take back to Jerusalem to the mother church. And he is using the churches in Macedonia as an example to spur the Corinthian church into giving liberally. And he says that church, in, those churches in Macedonia have been going through some extreme afflictions and tribulations, yet they have, they have exceedingly great joy and, and they have that in, in, in the fact that they, they, they share their riches in liberality. Do you see what he's saying? Paul is saying they have come to this conclusion, that they can lay aside their own great tribulation in order to contribute to the relief of someone else's tribulation. And as they do that, it brings great joy to their heart. Can I tell you one of the most dangerous things for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to do is to become inward looking become inward. You, you, you read the scriptures and nowhere in scripture is the church exhorted by Jesus or Paul or any of the other apostles to focus their attention on themselves. But I'm going to make a statement right now 
that probably will tick some of you off. But that's okay. I already told you that the preaching of the gospel would offend. And so right now you're going to have the opportunity to experience that offense if you want to. Now you don't have to, but if you want to, you can experience that offense. I'm going to say this. The average American church is more concerned with what goes on within their four walls than they are about a world that's going to hell. The average American church is more concerned about what goes on in their little religious activities within the four walls of the church than they are a world out there that's perishing. And as a result, listen to me, as a result, you go into those church services and there is absolutely no joy. Do you know why there's no joy? Because when we focus on ourselves, there is nothing within us to bring us joy. So we have focused on the wrong source of joy. When we focus ourselves on what God wants, and we go after what God wants and what God desires, then there's joy in our hearts even though we ourselves may be going through great tribulation because we understand that out there, somewhere, somebody is going through greater pain than we ever are going through. Some, I've, I've told this to the church here at Brownsville um, on uh, a couple of times, I guess, and so just bear with me. Um, uh, we had Robert Slairdon here uh, before the first of the year, and uh, Robert Slairdon said he was seeking God, and, and God had spoken to him and said that um, in this coming century and millennium that God was going to raise up sending churches that would send people into the harvest field. And that uh, not only was God going to raise those churches up and they were going to be senders, but God was going to finance those churches so that they would be capable of sending people. And boy, I was sitting over there, my heart just began to burn. And I, I thought, dear God, praise the Lord. You know, we're, that's, that's us. And um, uh, then I, I was uh, somewhere after that, and I got to thinking, God, you know, you talk to Robert Slairdon, and you talk to Steve Hill and John Kilpatrick, but you don't ever talk to me very much. Um, you know, and usually when you do, you don't say, now, son. You usually say, listen, dummy. And... Um, so I said, um, this was before the first of the year, and I said, God, um, I'd like to be able to get up and say to somebody, I was praying the other day and God spoke to me and said this. And I said, would you just do that so I'll have an illustration? <laughs> and I want you to know I almost fainted because God did speak to me. Now, normally God speaks to me through the Word of God and through uh, wise counsel and, and, and things. And, and occasionally, He will impress on me from the Holy Spirit certain things. But, you know, God just, He just won't put me on every com co committee that He has in the throne room. He just doesn't do that. And so I have to find out from somebody else what God's talking about a lot of times if it's outside the Bible. And um, so I, I was, uh, and so, but this time God spoke to me. And, and uh, he said, all right, said, I'm going to give you a word. And I said, praise God. He said, this is the word. In the coming millennium, the com coming century, this is the word. The greatest work of the church in the coming century and the coming millennium is going to be done outside the four walls of the church, not inside the four walls. That's what God spoke to me. So I've been telling that everywhere I've been. And, you know, I think it's wonderful that God's spoken to me. I mean, I, I just want to tell everybody that God still talks to me. I'm still, you know, I'm still one of those that uh, occasionally he speaks to. And I want everybody to know that so they'll think I'm spiritual. <laughs> when I'm called to speak overseas or around the country, you know, I can tell that story and everybody look at him and say, wow, that guy's spiritual. God talks to him. You know, that's wonderful. But, you know, the, the thing that just absolutely blows me away is that God would give me some insight into what his, he's thinking for the future. And God's, God's thinking for the future is this, folks. God is saying, get your mind, church, and get your attention, church, off yourself. And get your attention on what I have my attention on. And when you get your attention on what I have my attention on, guess what? The glory of God's going to come down. The power of God's going to infuse your life. And you're going to be moved in the direction I want you to go. 
Does that make sense to you? Boy, it makes sense to me. And, and here's what Paul said to that church in Corinth in verse 9 of chapter 8. He said, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So Paul said to this church in Corinth, Listen, if you will become liberal in giving to the needs of others, your joy is going to be great. God is going to enrich your life and uh, you're gonna be blessed beyond your wildest expectation. Now, neither Paul nor Peter nor am I suggesting, or, or suggesting that you become ecstatic about being in a furnace. That's not the point. I am suggesting, that, and they are suggesting, that you can have joy in spite of the furnace. And the one thing the world needs to see from the modern church is joy. But the truth of the matter is, I know very few absolutely joy-filled believers. Most of us are struggling so hard with the fiery trials we're going through in this day and age until we don't have much joy and we certainly don't have much left to give to other people because we're so concerned and consumed with what we're going through. But be careful to note that Peter is not suggesting here in verses 13 and 14, that God replaces suffering with glory. What Peter is saying here is that God transforms suffering into glory. So I want to say this. If you're going through a fiery trial right now, hang on and go through that thing, endure that thing, and keep your joy in the midst of that thing, and God is going to transform that into glory for you. Listen, I just read to you about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you think thousands of years later we would be talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego if they had not gone through the suffering of that fiery furnace? No, the only reason we know who they are is because they came through that experience. And what God did for them was to turn their suffering into a glory, a memorial to them that they're still held up as an example for modern day believers. Hallelujah. Paul says the glory, or Peter says the glory is to be revealed later. You see what he says here? He says that in verse 13, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. Now, you say, well, how much later? Well, I don't know how much later. I don't know. So I told you a moment ago that God talked to me the other day. But he didn't tell me how long we'd have to wait on this glory. You know, the Bible talks about going from glory to glory. So we may be in glory right here in the midst of this suffering and not even know it. And if we go through that suffering and maintain our joy, it may be that when we come through that suffering and come out of it, we've just gone from one glory into another glory. But every mature believer and mature people understand that life includes some postponed pleasures. Every mature person understands that. The immature does not understand postponed pleasures. But the mature understands that sometimes it is necessary to wait a while and keep being faithful before you experience the pleasure that is promised in a given situation. And here, Peter is saying that this glory that we're going to experience may be postponed. And we may be in this suffering situation, a fiery furnace for a while. But if we will just stay firm and maintain our joy, God is going to bring it into glory sooner or later. And Peter says, listen, you can have joy in the furnace because the spirit of glory and the spirit of God rest upon you. That's how you endure this thing. That's what he says here. The spirit of glory, and that's verse, verse 14, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So you can go through this thing with joy. The third fact about furnaces. What's the first fact? Everyone faces them. Second fact, 
You can have joy in the midst of the furnace. Third fact, furnaces can be learning experiences. Furnaces can provide you with some of the greatest revelation you will ever have. Let me read to you verses 15, uh, 16, 17, and 18 from 1 Peter 4. Peter says here in verse 15 of 1 Peter 4, Let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. Now we understand murder, thief, evildoer, but let me just interpret busybody for you. Keep your nose out of somebody else's business. Is that the explanation? That's what that Greek term means. Keep your nose out of somebody else's business, okay? <laughs> In other people's matters. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in the matter. Let him not be ashamed, but glorify God in the matter. In other words, Peter's saying here, don't let somebody tell you that you're going through this because God is judging you. Remember Job? Job's comforters came to him and said, you, you know, you walk around so holy and you present this, this religious facade or this spiritual facade, but somewhere inside of you, buddy, there's a deep spiritual problem. Well, Peter's saying here, if, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. Verse 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with earth, us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Now, if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? You say, what in the world does all of that have to do with knowing something or getting revelation? Well, bear with me for a moment, and I'll try to uh, help us understand that a little bit. You see, I'm not sure that the modern church understands suffering at all. Because when we go through suffering or fiery trials, we interpret that to be the judgment of God or the fact that God is absent. But I want to say to you that when you're in your deepest trial or when you're experiencing the most excruciating pain, that is when God is closest to you as one of his children. The three Hebrew children learned something in the furnace. They learned something in the furnace they would have never learned outside of the furnace. You know, all of us are standing out here in this air conditioning, or sitting in this air conditioning church tonight, and we cannot tell you anything revelationally about being in the middle of a fiery furnace like they were in. We can't tell because we haven't been there. They were there, and so they learned some things in the midst of that fiery furnace. They learned this, first of all. They learned that sometimes God does, does not deliver us from things, but allows us to go through things. One of, the, one of the greatest lessons you and I as a believer can learn is this, that God does not always deliver us out of, but God most of the time delivers us through. I said to you last week, when we get into one of these fiery furnaces, we begin to cry out, oh God, deliver me. And God says, no, I'm not going to deliver you. I'm going to develop you. You see, these guys told Nebuchadnezzar, God can deliver us. <laughs> but they soon found out that God did not deliver them the way they thought they were going to be delivered. They thought they were going to be delivered from the furnace. But I, I admire these three Hebrew children because they said this, we believe our God can deliver us, but if not, we're still not going to bow down. You see, we believe God can deliver us as faith, but if not, is trust. If not, says, if God chooses not to deliver me from this thing, I don't give a rip. If he doesn't deliver me, I'm still going to serve him. That's trust. That says that where faith leaves me, I'm going to trust God, and it will take me someplace faith is incapable of taking me. 
And where it took these three Hebrew children, trust took them right into the furnace. Took them right in the furnace. There are three kinds of Christians. There are those who believe God can. There are those who believe God will. And there are those who know God does. It has to do with the trust factor. Now let me talk to you for a moment about revelation in the midst of this furnace. I said that in the midst of the furnace, there are things we can learn. When we find ourselves in the midst of a furnace, some, we ought to have some questions that we ask ourselves. The first question we should ask ourselves is why am I in here? Why am I in here? Why am I in here? Peter says, let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evil do, evildoer, or a busybody in other people's matters. It could be, going back to the first point that I made when, when I said to you that we are the source sometimes of our being in a fiery furnace, it could be that sometimes the reason we're there is because we caused it. We caused it. It's for sure the three Hebrew children caused themselves to be thrown into the fiery furnace. They had an alternative. They could have bowed down and worshipped that idol, and they could have escaped. And here's the reasoning that they could have used. They could have said, well, we're going to bow down on the outside, and we're going to worship this thing, but inside we know that this is just a dumb idol, and so, you know, while we give uh, uh, outward obeisance to this thing inwardly, we're not really worshiping. They could have justified that. And, 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 and participated and, and used that as a rationalization. But you see, they said, no, we're not going to bow down outside nor inside. We're just not going to bow down, period. So they actually, by a decision they made, determined the fact that they were going to go into that fiery furnace. But I'm going to tell you something, friends. You and I are going to be called upon to make those same kinds of decisions today. And I'm telling you, it's worth standing up for God and making the decision and going through the furnace. One of the things that is so sickening in the, ch in the, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ today is noodle Christians. They don't have the backbone of a wet noodle. They find themselves in situations at work or on the job, and they won't stand up. I remember one time when I was in the Navy as a chaplain. Eight o'clock after eight o'clock reports, every night all the department heads would meet the executive officer and give a report from their departments. And, and then after the eight o'clock uh, reports, the chaplain would give the, the evening prayer uh, through, over the one MC throughout the ship. And I was a department head, so I had to make the department head meeting. And as soon as I finished the department head meeting, the, the XO would say to me, Chaplain, now you give the evening prayer. And so I'd pick up the microphone and flick it on, and it'd go throughout the whole ship, every space in the ship. And I would lead the ship in prayer. And so one night I did that and uh, left the uh, 8 o'clock report meeting, walked down to the wardroom, which is where the officers on the ship eat their meals, and, 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 you know, sort of a lounge where you relax. And uh, so I went down there to get a cup of coffee. And I walked into the wardroom. There were four or five officers sitting there. And um, this one guy who outranked me by one, one rank. I was a lieutenant at that time. He was a lieutenant commander. I walked in, in there and sat down and got a cup of coffee and sat down. And, and this guy was just seething angry. And, and um, you know, I spoke to him. I said, how you, how you doing, guys? And this guy just came right out, and I'm going to tell you what he said, and I'm not being sacrilegious, but I want you to understand. He said, Chaplain, your prayers just irritate the hell out of me. And I said, well, Commander, your foul mouth irritates me. Now, I'm going to tell you, friends, God will put you in a situation or allow you to be in a situation like that to make a statement sometime. I had another situation. I'll get back to this one in just a moment. But I had another situation that I reported aboard a destroyer squadron one time, went in to report my Commodore and said, uh, Commodore, I'm Chaplain Robertson. I'm reporting aboard as your squadron chaplain. 
And he looked up from his desk and he said, I didn't ask for you, I asked for a whiskey drink and Episcopalian. I'm standing there and this is my second, uh, this is my second assignment in the Navy. I'm standing at attention, this guy ain't even looking at me. He's looking down right signing papers. And he said to me, he just looked up and said, I didn't ask for you, I asked for a whiskey drink and Episcopalian. And I'm standing there and I thought, now what in the world? This guy's gonna, he's got my future in the Navy in his hands, what am I gonna do? And uh, I just got ticked off. And so I said, well, sir, what you got is a teetotaling Pentecostal. <laughs> now, he might not know what a Pentecostal was, but he knew what a teetotaler was. <laughs> but anyway, uh, this, this commander back in the wardroom, uh, I'm saying that God puts you in these situations to see what you're going to do. And, um, and, and this commander in the wardroom, he, he pushed his coffee back and sloshed coffee all over a white tablecloth and stormed out of that room. And I thought, dear God, he's gone to the commanding officer because I was disrespectful to him. Although I use sir, you know, sometimes in the military you can, you can be disrespectful if you put sir on the end of it. <laughs> it's like the private one time, he, he passed this young buck lieutenant and he, he saluted him three mornings in a row. The fourth morning, uh, he came by this second lieutenant and he did like that. And the second lieutenant stopped him and said, come here, private. He said, what are you doing? He said, three mornings in a row I passed you here and you've, you've given me a good military salute. This morning you do that. He said, what's going on with you? He said, well, sir, for the first three mornings I was only fed up with you to here, but today I'm fed up to there. But anyway, in about a half hour, this, this commander came back in the wardroom, and I was still sitting there, and I was alone. The other guys, they were embarrassed, and they, at this exchange, and so they got up and left. See, a wardroom on a ship is a gentleman's club, and you don't talk about religion and sex and politics, and you don't say anything offensive to anybody, and we had just both broken that rule. And so these other guys were embarrassed, and so they got up and left. And... Um, so in about 30 minutes, this, um, this um, commander came back in, and he sat down. He said, can I talk with you for a minute, chaplain? And I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, I was out of line a while ago, and he said, I want to apologize. And he said, I, I know the other officers that were in here, and I'll look them up, and I'll tell them that I've apologized for my behavior. And I said, well, I want to apologize too, sir, and I also will look them up, and I will apologize for my behavior. Did you know from that night, that very night, that officer never used a foul word in front of me again? The whole time I was on that ship, never used a file. And he had a mouth that you wouldn't put garbage in. I mean, it was filthy. But he never cursed in front of me again. And I'm just saying to you that sometimes, you know, we need to stand up, okay? Why am I here in this furnace? Well, they were there because they stood up. Second question we might ask ourselves, am I ashamed? If so, why? Is it pride? Peter says here in verse 16, he says, if anybody suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed. Let him not be ashamed. Get your head up if you're going through suffering. This may be God. And, and you know, if it isn't God, God's going to deliver you anyway. Remember Paul and Silas in that Philippian jail in Acts 16? They were there because of circumstances beyond their control, and God sent an angel and got them out. So we need to ask ourselves these questions. Why am I here? Am I ashamed? Number three, ask ourselves the question, am I a witness in this furnace? That's what Peter's talking about here in verses 17 and 18. And um, perhaps a better question than why is this happening to me would be what can I learn through this situation? So my third point is that furnaces provide opportunities for learning. The fourth and final fact about furnaces is that you can totally completely trust God in the midst of a furnace experience look at verse 19 of first Peter chapter 4 therefore let those who suffer according to the will of God did you hear that let those who suffer according to the will of God you say, are you saying that sometimes it's God's will for me to suffer? No, I'm not saying that. Peter said that. 
I'm telling you what Peter said. Let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful creator. Listen to me. God is too wise to make a mistake and he is too loving to be unkind. God is not a child abuser. You need to understand that everything that happens to you may not have an answer readily available for you and you don't have to understand it. You don't have to understand what's going on. You just, some, sometimes we get in the middle of these situations we say, I just don't understand, God, why you're allowing this to happen. And God says, you don't have to understand. You say, well, I'm sorry, I just can't take that. Well, we don't understand a lot of things and we, it doesn't bother us. For instance, do you understand the principle of electricity? I'd venture to say there isn't 40 people in here that understand the principle of electricity. But when we go home tonight, we will flip on a light. We will not stand there with our hand on a light switch and say, well, until I understand how electricity works and the principles of electricity, I'm not going to flip this light on because I don't understand. No, we'll just flip it on. You don't have to understand. We have been taught faith. Consequently, we've developed faith in faith. But I'm going to tell you, this modern church knows little or nothing about trust. Peter says, some of you who are in the furnace are there because it is God's will for you to be there. That's what he said. Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God. Peter says, some of you are there because it's God's will. And your question may be, well, then what should I do? Peter answers that. He says, commit your soul to your creator, for he is faithful. What is your soul? Your soul is your mind, your will, and your emotions. Peter's saying, don't let your mind get out of whack here. And don't let your emotions get out of whack here. Don't get your will engaged to make stupid decisions when you're here. Stay steady in the boat. Commit your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions to God. And I'm going to tell you why he tells you to do that. Because it's in the soul that hell comes against us and that's where the battleground is. It's in what we think and how we feel. You see, Satan is not as big and bad as we think he is. Satan came into the Garden of Eden to destroy mankind. And that was his sole purpose. But notice the technique he used to destroy mankind. He got into a conversation. Now listen, if I had the ability to destroy you, do you think I'd get in a conversation with you? There's no way. I would just use whatever ability I had to destroy you and destroy you if that's what I wanted to do. But you see, Satan does not have as much power as we think he has. So what he does is this. He comes and gets in our thinking and in the way we feel about things, and we take care of destroying ourselves. We start these things. And that's why Peter says, commit your soul to the Lord in the midst of this thing. Commit your soul to the Lord in the midst of this thing. And trust God. Now this word commit in the Greek is from a Greek word which is a banking term. It's very closely related to our English word deposit. What Peter's saying is this, deposit your mind, your will, and your emotions. Deposit those with God because he is your faithful creator. There's a striking example of this truth in the book of Jeremiah, chapter 32. And I don't have time to go there and read it, but I, want to, I just want to give you the reference of it, and I want you to read it. It's a hilarious story, really. Let me tell it to you real quickly. Jeremiah is prophesying in uh, Jeremiah 32 that God is going to restore Israel to the land that God had promised Abraham and his descendants. 
But there was a problem with that. While he was prophesying that God was going to restore Israel to the land, Babylon was occupying the land. And Babylon was almost at the point of capturing Jerusalem itself. And Jeremiah's prophesying, God's going to deliver us. God's going to deliver us. God's going to deliver us, man. Y'all just hang in here. God's going to deliver us. And these Israelites were looking out, and everywhere they looked, there was a Babylonian army. 586, you know that Jerusalem, was, uh, Jerusalem fell and was destroyed. Well, Jeremiah had a cousin by the name of Hanamel. And here's what Hanamel did. He offered Jeremiah an option to purchase the family land which was now occupied by the Babylonians. <laughs> Hanamel said, Jeremiah, you're prophesying here that God's going to restore the land. He said, I, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. I'll sell you the family farm that the Babylonians are camping on right now. <laughs> and here's the funny thing about it. Jeremiah had to put his money where his mouth was. And he did it. And if you read Jeremiah 32, you will find that Jeremiah was, became the laughing stock of Israel because of what he did. He trusted God to restore the land. Now, I told you a while ago that pleasures are sometimes delayed. The mature person understands that. Jeremiah understood that God was going to, God had made a covenant with Abraham, and God is faithful to covenants. If God said it, you can take it to the bank and deposit it. And Jeremiah knew that God was going to restore the land. And here this crooked cousin of his, I, I mean, this must have been a descendant of Jacob for sure. You know, because Jacob was as crooked as a dog's hind leg, and here he is saying to Jeremiah, hey, let me sell you some land, man. Let me sell you some waterfront property in Arizona. <laughs> and Jeremiah bought it because he trusted God. I'm saying to you, friends, a fact about a furnace is this. You can trust God in the midst of the furnace, and God will bring you through with flying colors. Now, you may become the laughingstock like Jeremiah did. And so let me conclude. God's going to have a people, and sometimes the only way to develop his people is through fiery trials. And we as his people that are going to be developed by him, we can respond to those fiery trials in one of two ways. We can view those as punishments, or we can view those as perfectors. The greatest witness the lost world will ever see is a believer in a furnace. You see, these unbelievers out there, they're not gonna, they're not gonna come to your church. And they're not gonna turn on Christian television. They're not gonna turn on a, a, a gospel preacher on the radio. The only Jesus they're gonna see is you and me. And they're gonna, they're gonna get an impression of who Jesus is by what they see in us. And so the greatest witness the lost world will ever see is a believer in a furnace. And every believer in a furnace is a witness. We're either a good one or a bad one. You know, Texas A&M University has a student body that's referred to by the football team as the 12th man. The student body is the 12th man on the football team. You all know that are familiar with football, and if you are not familiar with football, you're probably not going to go to heaven. There are, 11, there are 11 men on a football team. And, uh, and uh, Texas A&M says, we have a 12th man. It's our student body. They're in the stands. But they're there in support. And if you ever watch a Texas A&M football game, when they score a touchdown, the guys came out, the, the, there are a certain number of guys that come out and get on the, in the front-leaning rest position, and they do uh, a push-up for every point they score. If they score a score. Uh, seven points uh, of, uh, of touchdown, an extra point. They do seven push-ups, and they go back to the stands. If they score another one, they come out and do 14 push-ups, and they go back to the stands. If they score 100 points, they come out and do 100 push-ups, and they go back to the stands. This inspires that football team. See, they're out there getting their brains knocked out on a football field, 
and they look over on the sideline after they've scored and maybe they've got an injury or something they see these guys the 12th man doing push-ups and it just buoys them up and it helps them I want to tell you this that you have a 12th man in the furnace and that 12th man is none other than the Son of God who promised that he would never leave you nor forsake you but he would go with you always even to the end of the world and that's the facts about furnaces now some of you in this room you're going through furnaces right now I know in my heart that there are people in this room you're going through some deep weeds right now and you've been wondering and maybe you've even become bitter at God and you may be here and you may be an unsaved person and you might say well if God was really God uh, you know, I wouldn't have AIDS, or I wouldn't have emphysema, or, or I wouldn't be an alcoholic, or I wouldn't be a drug addict. If God was really God, I wouldn't be going through this. Yes, you would, because you made a decision that puts you in that garbage. But I'm telling you, there's somebody that can get you out. His name is Jesus, and he's right here tonight. And he wants to help every person that's made a lousy decision in their life. I have to tell you that I have made some extremely lousy decisions in my life. But Jesus, when I threw myself on his mercy, got me out of those situations, and he will you. There are some folks in this room right now, you're as backslidden as you can be because you've made some lousy decisions. You've gotten bitter at God because God didn't answer the prayer you wanted answered in the way you wanted it answered. Why don't you just relax and let God be God? And why don't you just come on back home? You still hang around church, but you don't have any joy. Because your joy leaked out a long time ago when that fiery trial punctured your boat and the water started coming in. And your boat of life is just about to be swamped because of bitterness and resentment. Your boat of life has all kind of stuff that's come in through that puncture. And you wonder tonight whether God's even there or not. I'm telling you that if you get anything out of this message tonight, get this, that God knows where you are. Even the hair on your head are numbered. Do you know those disciples? When they were in the middle of the Sea of Galilee in the midst of a storm, Jesus sent them there. The storm didn't surprise him. He knew it was going to be there. And he came to them walking on the water in the middle of that storm, and he calmed that thing, and he can do it in your life. And there may be those of you who serve in God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, but, I mean, you are absolutely being bombarded by hell. And you may be at the point tonight where you think, I can't take any more of this. God doesn't know where I am. I, you know, I've prayed and the heavens are brass. I'm telling you tonight that God has a purpose behind that. And if you will just get your eyes off your misery and get your eyes on him, he'll bring you through this thing. He'll bring you through this thing. And so I'm going to give an invitation right now. I'm not appealing to your emotions, none whatsoever. I'm not appealing to any soulish response, a mind, will, uh, emotional response. I am appealing to a will response, but not a mind or emotional response. But I wonder if you're here tonight, and you have things going on in your life that you need to take care of, and you know you need to do that, and you need to do it tonight. I'm happy to tell you that Jesus is here to help you, but you must come to him. You must come to him. So I'm going to ask you to stand, if you will, please. Everyone stand. Now, I'm going to count three, and if you have anything in your life you need to pray about, if you're lost, you're backslidden, you're going through extreme uh, circumstances and situations right now, you are in a fiery furnace for whatever. I'm going to ask, give you the invitation to come down here. I'm going to count three, and you step out of your seat and come. Somebody standing between you and the aisle, just tell them to excuse you. Everybody ready? One, two, three. Come. 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 Just get on your knees down here, and God's going to hear your prayer. I promise you, God's going to hear your prayer. Everything is in his hand, Mike. Everything is in his hands. Do you believe that? Those can just be the words of a beautiful song. Or they can be...